That's ten million dollars from me to you. He's the fifth richest man in the world, the biggest foreign investor in America, and a major shareholder in the world's best-known brands. He meets global leaders and business icons. So why is so little known about Prince Al Walid? World Trade Center Twin Towers lay smoldering one month after being struck down in a terrorist attack involving Arab hijackers, many of them from Saudi Arabia. America was still in shock. Prince Al Walid flew in from his home in the Saudi capital Riyadh for just a day to express his sympathy and offer some help. I'm here to give my condolences to you and to all the families and to show our alliance with you and sympathy and support. He toured Ground Zero with New York's mayor, Rudolf Giuliani, at a time when the city was consumed with anger at the Arab world. That's number one here. Number one, up 104 stories. Prince Al Walid had most of his $20 billion empire lodged in the US economy and carried with him a large check for the victims and families. Well, Mr. Mayor, you know, I'm not going to take much of your time. I know you're so busy. I came all the way from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Thank you. just to see you and give my contribution personally to you right now for the people in New York, and hopefully it will help alleviate as much as you can under your leadership. Well, we need your help. And that's $10 million Thank from you. me to you. And please, we'll be in touch for anything that you may need. And we very we'll much need your help and your support. All was going well until the prince issued a press release that created a controversial media storm. The line that most upset the New York mayor stated, we must address some of the issues that led to such a criminal attack and adopt a more balanced stance to the Palestinian cause. Giuliani rejected the $10 million check and publicly criticized the prince for making a political statement. The aftermath of the 9-11 attack was the first time I took notice of the name Al Walid bin Talal, and I wanted to find out more. The prince agreed to give me an exclusive and candid look at his life over one year. So I traveled to the south of France where he was taking his summer vacation. We began with a tour of his huge floating palace, the 5KR. Thanks, guys. Cheers. These, these are the flags of the companies involved in okay. all these. These are the companies we're involved with all these, and nationally, regionally, internationally. Are they probably. growing or shrinking? Well, uh, most of them are growing, thanks God. OK, excellent. I mean, is the if, number if, of flags if, growing? Or? If they don't grow, I don't grow. And where else uh, do you find, where, where do you find refuge in this boat? Where is your sort of quiet spot? Oh, there's no quiet spot here at all. I mean. <laughs> There's no quiet spot at all. Oh, he's busy. And then, Jensen's parachuting right now. Ah, OK, that's Mike. That's, he's parachuting. He began already. And how much did you pay for it? What? Uh, very bargain price. It's less than $20 million. Less than $20 million? Yeah, because actually the insurance value of this boat is more than $100 million. It was a bargain at that time. So you're doing business even with your pleasure items? Well, sure. I mean, uh, myself, I would not build... Uh, at that time, I wouldn't have built it, but it came at a really bargain price, so I did it. It has a bit of a history, doesn't it? Oh, definitely, yes. It right. was owned by Adnan Khashoggi and then by Trump, mm -hmm. and Sultan Brunei also owned it for a short while. I and understand that... it was in a film as well? Oh, yes, it was a film, yeah. The James Bond. Movie. James Bond, yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. Never Say yeah. Never Again, and it certainly feels and like you're walking through the set of a James Bond so movie when you're on a five-story boat of yeah. this size. And that's it costs gym. $6 million a year Small just gym. to maintain it. I do water skiing, um, uh, I swim, I walk, I jog, and volleyball, tennis, basketball, everything. And how much do you encourage that kind of activity with, uh, within your staff? Oh, very much so. You've seen, you know, all of them began with me and they ended with me. They all fit. All the one of them, one or two of them smoke <laughs> once in a while. The lifestyle on this boat is distinctly Western and seems far removed from the prince's Saudi roots. But he's very much at home in this culture too. It may be because he started coming to Cannes with his father more than 30 years ago. It's since become the destination for the Arab elite. And now, as a self-made billionaire, he makes sure he has everything he could possibly need. And this helicopter, you know, is named after my daughter, Reem. Mm -hmm. And uh, we use it sometimes. We need to go to a close by destination uh, from Cannes. We just have a shortcut rather than going for two, three hours by car. Just go do it 15 minutes with this one. So the desert prince feels at home on the sea as well? Oh, really? You know, anywhere where you have nature, whether it's the sea, the snow, or desert, 
I feel at home, really. I like it. Ah, finished, Jensen? This really was great. Seven, eight, 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 okay. Among a small group of guests invited to join the Prince on the 5KR every summer, one stands out in particular. I was curious to know how a Californian by the name of Chuck ended up in the entourage of a Saudi royal. Well, I met the Prince when I was in a, uh, working in a uh, big department store back in California. And uh, he came in one morning and... Uh, he was looking for some merchandise in another area in which I wasn't working, and that's how we became uh, connected. And he called me later on that evening, and I went over to his home in Atherton, California. And I came over with equipment of uh, music, stereo twin. And we stayed up, His Highness and myself, until 5 a.m., setting up all the merchandise. As I would discover to my cost, the prince likes to stay up all night reading extensively and making international business calls and his entourage is expected to keep up. We set off for the shore in the late evening to have four hours of business and social meetings in cafes but not before Prince Al-Walid's regular power walk along the promenade. How do people react to you when you're walking with an entourage, you have bodyguards with you? You walk through quite a public area. How do you find people react to you? I think they're used to that now. I mean, these are not only uh, uh, bodyguards and entourage. These, these are friends also. You know, I really like the Mediterranean. Plus, uh, Cannes is centrally located. From here, you can go within 12 hours to Italy. You can go to Spain, Corsica, Sardinia. All within 20, 12 hours on my boat. Uh, press them very hard to have this meeting so we can really have this Fairmont Plaza and the Meridian um, uh, meetings all the same day. OK. OK, we're ready. Thank you. See you then. See you in Paris. No, we'll give it to you. The prince survives on about five hours of sleep daily, getting up at around 11 o'clock in the morning. His long days help him to keep across the world's financial markets and give him time to pack in meetings, exercise, dining, and lots of reading. I cannot switch off at all because we are working on so many fronts um, and they all need uh, close and, and continuous attention. And I don't mind, I like it. And uh, frankly speaking, uh, to me, there's no uh, vacation completely. As his doctor, don't you worry about his health? His health is like Islam. He is in excellent health. We do checkups every year. Everything is excellent. For the staff, keeping up with their boss is quite a challenge. I know how to uh, cope with His Royal Highness. I know when to have 10 minutes sleep when, when I can have it in order to uh, keep on going. If I have two hours of non-stop uh, uh, things to do. The prince has constant meetings on the yacht. On this occasion, he'd gathered top executives from the Arab music industry. After acquiring full ownership of the Rotana label, he wanted to launch a music channel to spotlight his large list of top recording artists. Within a year, Rotana was a smash hit with three channels on air. The prince selected the right people for it, plus he was involved directly in each and every small detail. And uh, you know how energetic he is and how dedicated he is when doing something. Uh, he was, he's very uh, picky and, uh, and he follows every small detail. And uh, I think this is what made the success. Okay, okay. We have to do something to solve it. And your account runs into the billions, around 20 billion in your case. Can you actually spend the money as fast as you make it? No, not really. I mean, uh, when you say 20 billion dollars, that's, that's the total wealth I have. But obviously, if a guy's income from that, let's say, is around uh, 500, 600 million dollars every year, for sure he can spend it on on, on, on personal basis. But obviously, he can reinvest it in uh, into into projects, into uh, into buying more companies that that need assistance and help, and uh, and create more wealth. Obviously.
the scale of your, your vacation as you take it though, are you able to say what, what you spend on a vacation like this? I spend, I spend quite a bit. No details? No, I spend quite a bit, but uh, you know, I, the important thing is, is, is that I'm happy, my family is happy, and my, the people around me are happy. It's the end of the visit to Cannes, and Al Walid and his son, Prince Khalid, go through the tradition of saying goodbye to the crew. Over the next 11 months, they'll clean, polish, and maintain the yacht to ensure it's ready for the royal arrival next summer. It's hard to imagine, but the prince has now outgrown this vessel, and he already has the next one on the drawing board. More than twice the size of the 5KR, it accommodates at least two helicopters, and the prince has planned it to be the biggest and most expensive private yacht in the world. Excuse me. Air condition, please. Al-Walid likes to travel with his people, whether in a regular tourist coach or in what at first appears to be a regular Boeing 767. This type of airliner usually hauls about 200 people across continents in relative comfort. But after a refit, the prince has his own version of first class. From 2.6 to 3.2, Mr. It's a short hop to Paris, but with a crew of nine and a growing staff, legroom's getting tight. So the prince is refitting a 747, kingdom style. But even up here, he can still find a corner for his prayers. Chuck gets nervous in turbulence, and the prince is quick to tease him about it. A lot of people visiting Paris are looking for the latest fashions along the Champs Elysees. When the prince went shopping on the tarmac of Le Bourget Airport, it was to buy a small jet, and six finalists, carefully selected from around the world, were lined up for his inspection. With an energetic pace, he didn't waste time and knew exactly what he was looking for. I was about to get my first glimpse of his negotiating skills. Well, the sellers soon realized they were up against a tough customer with only minutes to state their case. And the charter market is yeah. not very good. It is the easiest. Right. So uh, we have three aircraft and really only business for two. I think. Okay, you can put the seat here. You can, uh, there isn't one, but you can, yes. Can you call the captain, please? Yes. yes. Michael. Do you always do business at such a pace? Oh, yeah. Everything is done very quickly. And this is very swift. Because it looks like you've just come in and decided to buy a plane last minute. No, 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 no. This is this. The decision has been taken two months ago, and the research began uh, two months ago. Are you at the haggle stage? Almost. <laughs> With enough wealth to buy five thousand of these jets, it's surprising he would haggle at all. But this businessman prince is always looking for the best deal. Even a billionaire likes a bargain. It's all a matter of scale. Uh, the kingdom will buy one of the Hawker Sidleys, but you have to compete. And tell them we pay tomorrow morning if we can have the contract ready. Some people spend hours shopping, but Prince Al Walid needed just 20 minutes.
even bird Dubai. It is not the best hotel, but nice, straightforward hotel. But we need another Dubai, another moving pick there for our landmark. But it came cheap. Like we have, why not? The pianist no longer plays Mission Impossible every time the prince appears. A puzzle Dalwaleed had asked him why he chose such a tune when nothing is impossible. Oh. One person who makes things possible for the prince, wherever and whenever, is Rauf Aboud, head of communications. I met up with him at his makeshift control center at the Georges Sank. His Royal Highness is a connected man. Wherever he is, we, he should have a phone and he should have TV. Uh, sometimes he has conference call, two, three, two, three conference call a day. Just when he's working, he says, okay, I want a conference call with this guy, this guy, should I have to make all the people online and he talk to them and he make deals, yeah. It's very important because I like to be informed, I like telecommunications, I like technology. I like to be, uh, in, uh, I like to know what's going on around me very much. Hello, Brett. Did he explain to the situation? So he does business on the fly. He does business wherever, I think. Even when he's sleeping, he does business. Sure. <laughs> Among Al Walid's many investments, the Georges Sank is particularly close to his heart. Perhaps because his father used to bring him here as a child. He now owns it 100%. Well, you know, this very historical hotel. This hotel has been built more than, uh, more than 70 years ago. Uh, plus, when I bought it, it was really, the situation deteriorated substantially. It became almost a three-star hotel. So once we took it, we, uh, we renovated it and we invested in it a lot. And in, the, in two years after its operation, it became number one hotel. And just two weeks ago, it was announced number one hotel all, uh, in the world also for the third consecutive year. He's always had a, uh, a desire to own that hotel. And uh, we had a bit of a difference of opinion because of, did it make financial, was it a good economic investment? To buy it, to fix it, the process you'd have to go through. But I must give him credit. He restored it according to what we believed was necessary, which meant closing the hotel, literally gutting it, and restoring it beyond its former glory. I mean, what you see today is much better than it ever was. The flowers alone cost one million dollars per year and are such a feature that people come in just to see them. The prince was involved in many of the details of the refurbishment and added personal touches. Well, you know, I'm a Muslim, I'm an Arab, I'm very proud of my, my heritage and my culture. Uh, and I just put two verses of the Quran that are very relevant and very close to my heart. And I put them in the main entrance of the, of the lobby over here. They say, if you thank your God, your God will give you more. That's one verse. The other verse says, all this is for my God's blessings. Al-Walid has invested heavily into the hotel sector and bought into the Four Seasons and Fairmont groups before they became top global brands. More recently, he added Mervenpick to the list. He's also established his own investment group, which owns a growing portfolio of properties across the Middle East. His debut in the hotel business was not at the real estate level. He, he took an interest in Four Seasons Hotels Management Company and then with Fairmont Hotels Management Company. It was very much driven uh, with a vision and a strategy around it. It was not an opportunistic uh, ad hoc accident. This is prime land. This is, this is the heart of Damascus. We had to get it. Yani. Without this, we would not be a home run. The prince is a, is a person that builds his investments around partnerships, doesn't go alone. And that's why we go and invest in Four Seasons. We don't try and rebuild another brand and try to compete with Four Seasons. They're very good at it. They've done it for many years. We go in and we tag along their success and try to enhance the value of that investment. Same thing with Fairmont, same thing with uh, Movin Pigs. He has a lot of knowledge about the industry. He thinks about it very strategically and he actively helps the companies that he invests in. When we look at the Fairmont investment that he made, it was roughly the same time as his Four Seasons investment. Um, and again, I think that both the underlying real estate and the ultimate equity value that he has in our company has performed very well. So he has been, uh, he has been a winner as far as hotel investments are concerned. But not all his investments have a fairy story ending. We've had uh, some challenges. Uh, many people in his situation, if they hadn't had instant financial gratification, may have, uh, may have run away. 
But at the end of the day, uh, you make some money out of a deal like Citibank, you probably will lose some out of stuff like Disney. Or, or some people say that he's uh, pulled out at the wrong time from Canary Wharf. But still, that doesn't belittle his achievements and belittle his uh, financial standing. The same people make the same critique about Warren Buffett. And I find it amusing that uh, the two most successful investors in the world today, the wealthiest two full-time investors in the world today, have a similar strategy and follow it out identically. Both are known as buy and hold. Both are critiqued that they don't know when to sell. They know their strategy and how to carry it out, and it is clearly successful. It is a development that is way ahead of its, its age. Clearly, there's an issue with the capital structure because it has too much debt on it. Through Disney, it's, it's, a, it's a force and power to be reckoned with, and its best days are yet to come in the future. Every deal is not uh, equally successful in anything that you do. And I can't put myself in his shoes, but I think him being involved with investing in Disney, whether it's Euro Disney or whether it's the parent company, the Walt Disney Company, uh, gives him a portfolio and credibility to go together with his Citibank, which was obviously a great financial deal, and other great deals he has. While he's down on his high-profile Euro Disney investment, it's had very little impact on his overall portfolio and doesn't trouble him financially, though it may become one of the most expensive roller coaster rides he takes. As we headed out from Paris, the Prince's trip was coming to an end, and I would soon be leaving my look at his summer vacation. It struck me that in two weeks, I'd experienced what only a handful of people get to see. As the 767 came into view and we drove straight onto the tarmac, I realized how the world is such a small place when you have your own private jet, with no pushing trolleys full of luggage and no queuing at airports. Let's go. When it's delivered, the Prince's new 747 will only add to that comfort. I was starting to see his life as one surprise after another. And that's the case at every port of call. OK, OK, Doctor. Trading by a goal in this opening chunk with about three minutes remaining. And straight through to the Prince of Wales. The Prince of Wales kept under the watchful eye of Alan Gear Masood. And he sends it through. The Prince's company was sponsoring a prestigious polo competition attended by the British elite. Despite coming from different cultures and traditions, all royals speak a common language. Even casual moments have an air of formality, although prince to prince, a few secrets are revealed. Al-Walid told Prince Charles how his uncle, Crown Prince Abdullah, had let Queen Elizabeth drive him around her estate during his visit to Britain. The Crown Prince confessed he'd been terrified by her driving. Prince Charles smiled knowingly. I hope we see you in uh, India, maybe. New York was the destination for me to find out about the Prince's investments. After all, he's the largest foreign investor on Wall Street. His portfolio stretches across dozens of American companies, all of them household names. His strategy is to research major brands, set a price target, and move in only when that target is reached. This is how he bought into Rupert Murdoch's powerful media company, News Corp. When the Australian tycoon was down on his luck in 1997, it created the perfect opportunity for an investor like Al-Walid. Very shrewd, um, very analytical, yet at the same time um, prepared to, to gamble and to go against the sort of prevailing thoughts about markets. And so he's, he's very original in his thinking. I joined the Prince on his way to meet the top executives at Citigroup. More than half his wealth is invested in the company. Back in 1991, bad loans left the bank urgently needing a major cash injection. No one was willing to risk their money. Were we on our knees? Yes. Were we substantively on our knees in the sense that if you'd brought an accountant in, would he have said that? No. Uh, but the markets felt that. He really had done his homework. I mean, he understood what we were, he understood what our weaknesses were, what our strengths were, what the opportunities were. And so it was, you know, there was no need for a long explanation on my part as to where we were going and why. He... 
we went through some bad times after the prince uh, had made his investment, and he was very good. He was professional. He wanted to know what was going on. He gave me the ba the benefit of his point of view, but he didn't jump up and down and yell at me and say, "Hey, Reed, you should do this and you should do that." All of a sudden, here was somebody completely unknown to the normal individual, um, becoming the largest shareholder of the largest financial institution in the United States. Prince Al Walid ended up with nearly 15 percent of the bank, which worried the U.S. Federal Reserve. He'd come on the scene not long after the ill-fated Bank of Credit and Commerce International (BCCI) collapsed under the weight of money laundering and fraud involving Saudi investors. American regulators were tense and ultimately failed to permit the prince to keep his entire stake. Bowing to regulations, he sold some stock to meet a 10 percent restriction on foreign ownership of U.S. banks. I think that this was at a time when there were some other problems in the banking industry and where you know, there had been concern about people fronting for consortiums and so on, not, not related to Citicorp but to other financial institutions. And so the regulators were perhaps justifiably very a little nervous about, you know, who is this, what is this, and so on. Many questioned how the prince had raised nearly $600 million to invest in Citicorp. But we've seen him make money in real estate locally. We've seen him make money in contracting, a lot of money in contracting and real estate in Saudi Arabia, even more money in his investments overseas, all of which that has gone through us. So Citibank is certain. I'm certain that the money was made both legally and it was made in his name, it was his money. I think uh, that the prince uh, you know, really stepped up to the plate at a very difficult time and for, and for enough money to uh, make uh, the whole transaction very believable. And I think that uh, you know, what he did really saved the bank. He is really a long-term investor. So the prince is vindicated as a long-term investor. The decade between 1991 and 2001 saw his Citibank shares increase by $8.2 billion. In the 12 months up to 2004, Forbes magazine lists his wealth increasing by $3.8 billion. Just imagine that's more than $10 million a day, $400,000 an hour or $120 every second. Traveling on to his daughter's graduation, he put aside the business calls and television monitoring to share the moment. Surrounded by friends and family, he beamed like any other proud father. What's the next step for you now? Well, I guess I'm going to get some work experience, then I'll uh, think about my masters. What about the celebration? Just out of words. <laughs> I don't know, I'm so happy all my family's here. Just... Your Highness, your emotion on this day too. I'm very proud of him. She's a good lady, Magna Cum Laude. She can work with me and her brother. So the pressure begins now? <laughs> Just begun. Keeping a tight schedule, the prince left his daughter and made his way to New Haven's Hartford Bradley Airport. Waiting for him there was the private jet I'd witnessed him haggling over in Paris just five months earlier. The Hawker Sidley had already been refitted and painted in the colors of his music and entertainment company, Rotana. It was time for another detailed Al Walid inspection. What made you take up skiing? Well, as you know, he's been with me now for several months, and you know, I like sports. And I do all kinds, all kinds of sports, maybe around 40 kinds of sports. But you only started it a few years ago. Yeah, well, I got it from my children. Are you able to keep up with them? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying. The prince's son and daughter joined him at the ski resort later, and I wanted their view on how he mixes the demands of his tough business life with family time, especially when there's a phone constantly in his hand. Yeah, we can begin 21, 22, begin, and then we'll see where to go. All, ca all cash, all cash. Prince Al Walid is, is very busy. He's a you know, professional and international businessman. He crams so much in that he may not have enough time for family. How do you react to that kind of idea? You're mistaken. He does have lots of time for family. It's very amazing how he switches so fast. It's, it's a difficult situation for you. You're a woman working in Saudi Arabia. The climate hasn't been ideal for a woman to be independent. How do you feel about that? Well, it's starting to develop now. I mean, if you think like five years before now, it's like 
Women never used to work. You wouldn't even think about it. But now it's, it's, it's developing. How did your relationship with your father change once there was a professional element to it as far as business? It really, um, there's, always, there's always a difference between, between father-son and then employee-employer. Uh, and in the office, it's always it's always a boss. Of course, there's always the element of a father because there is always a higher respect as as I demand it as well as Islam demands it. There's a proverb in Arabic that says, uh, uh, "No one, nothing scratches your back like your fingers." And they are my fingers, my my brain, my my mind, and my heart. These two. Al Walid's royal start began in 1957 with quite a pedigree. His father, Prince Dalal, was the 21st son of the late King Abdulaziz, the founder of modern Saudi Arabia, while his mother, Princess Mona, was the daughter of Lebanon's first post-independent prime minister, Riyad al Salah. Al-Walid's parents were very independent characters who ended up divorcing when the prince was just five years old. I always wanted them to be together. You know, it's like another child wanted to be next to, to his mother and father. But since this thing, this thing could not happen and materialize, I had to bear the fact that I, have to, I had to uh, divide my time between my father and mother. The young Al-Walid shuttled between his mother's home in Beirut and Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, where his younger brother and sister stayed with their father. Prince Talal had not long returned from exile in Egypt for his outspoken political comments calling for reform in the Saudi kingdom. Despite awe and respect for his strict father, Al-Walid led an undisciplined and unsettled life as witnessed by his childhood friends. His personal life, his family life wasn't stable and school required some kind of stability. And I think between the boarding schools in Lebanon, between living at home, between England, between Saudi Arabia, uh, it, it became a bit of a, of, a, of a turbulent thing for him. And this turbulent childhood made Al-Walid ignore his studies and constantly run away from home, leading to more than one merry chase to find him. And my father sent six, seven, eight people to look at me all over Riyadh. And actually, I, when I, was, I thought that I'm going to go to a place where they, they will never think I'll be in. I'll be in. So I went to my, to my bedroom inside the house of my father. I was there for three, four days, and looked at me all over the place, excluding that place. So I was in a place where they never thought I'll be. He, he was the rebel because the divorce between his mother and father, uh, uh, he took the side of his mother uh, a couple, uh, more than once. And uh, this made him, in a sense, an outcast. So he wasn't, uh, he didn't enjoy the privileges of, of the other young Saudi prince. Another childhood friend recalls the complex relationship and emotional tension the prince had, having to call two very different countries home. He is a prince. He's at the same time Lebanese and Saudi, so different cultures, uh, different uh, ways of thinking, different minds. And I think that it was even for him, very difficult to be able to be Lebanese at the same time and Saudi. I was wondering if you brought him back to Saudi Arabia to the military academy because he was so rebellious. It was one of the turning points in my life whereby I be, be, became very self-dependent, uh, independent and very much uh, uh, myself uh, doing uh, washing the toilets, bathrooms, having breakfast six six o'clock in the morning and have, having a breakfast, lentil soup and spaghetti. Walking through the grounds of his old school in Beirut, I pondered on the influences that had shaped him, from the divorce of his parents to life in a military academy, which possibly explains his obsessive precision at work and play even now. There was also a strong competitive spirit at an early age. A daily ritual, we had one hour of monopoly. And practically every single time he beat me, and I think I had brains to, to be able to resist his onslaught, but he always managed to beat me in Monopoly. So I knew that he's going to make money. Keen to study at the International College in Beirut, the prince finally buried his head in books and passed his exams with flying colors, but remained a lively teenager. Drag racing, the wildlife. Oh, yeah. We had our uh, Beirut then was, uh, was a place where uh, the good life was all over. It was abundant uh, for somebody young, uh, with well-connected, some cash, he could, he could manage. 
But Lebanon's civil war changed the young prince's plans. In April 1975, the destruction of Beirut began in a prolonged and bitter civil war, and the young prince was forced to seek university admission overseas, choosing Menlo College in California. Being so far from Riyadh and his family, he had little to do except focus on his studies. I presume it was a real lonely time for him because he was there all by himself. There wasn't anyone else, it was just him. Him and me and the phone calls of Saudi Arabia and school. That was basically it. Chuck would come to visit him here at this typical American ranch house. Social life was almost non-existent and all the prince focused on was getting his degree in business administration and getting back home. By the time he returned to Riyadh to tap into the oil boom, he had new responsibilities. He had married and had a baby boy. Prince Khalid was born in April 1978. The young father quickly set up camp in the Saudi capital to make his fortune in the remarkable business environment fueled by black gold. Commissions from contracts were a quick way to fill the bank account, but Al-Walid wanted more. He wanted to practice what he had just learned in the USA. Some companies used to just sign with the contractors. I used to work with them, I used to raise equity for them, as I get debt for them, and work, work really very hard for them. I don't know if I, I should say this, but you know, royals in general, they earn their living by being a royal. What made him different is that he earned his way. Al-Walid started by taking on the banking sector, with Saudi Arabia's first hostile takeover. Long hours and tough measures turned the United Saudi Commercial Bank from a loss maker to profitability in less than two years. Following up with a series of mergers and acquisitions, the prince eventually ended up creating the powerful Saudi-American bank, Samba, the region's leading player. It became an eye of the hurricane, seeing everything. I took a decision over there whereby no one could buy even a pencil without my approval, my personal approval. If a company is sleeping, not doing good, if you have bad management, and you have management not doing good, then it should be a candidate for takeover. And that's what we did. So we, we, gave, we gave a message to the companies that if you don't wake up, you're candidate for takeover. The prince's small business soon grew into one of Saudi Arabia's most influential, the Kingdom Holding Company, which in early 2004 relocated from a small two-story building to the 66th floor of Al-Walid's landmark Kingdom Tower, built on land he'd bought at a bargain price during Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. His son and daughter now work with him, joining a core team of about two dozen people who run his business empire. Basically, most of the ideas he likes to bring himself uh, because he trusts the fact that he has gone through deep thinking before versus somebody else bringing an idea because it sounded good. You know, he <laughs> plays a poker hand, you know, you, you can not know whether he really wants to, do the, wants to continue with the deal or not, or whether he's lost interest, you know. He even has his own people sometimes confused as, as to what's happening. The prince has also actively started to recruit women, particularly Saudis, into his ranks. It's very important for His Highness to have ladies um, playing a big role in the society, uh, as he's doing in his company, in his uh, palace. Uh, he's giving them the power to prove themselves. Now firmly settled in Riyadh, he keeps no homes outside Saudi Arabia. Why bother when he can build his own resort and oasis on the outskirts of town? Actually, this is a land that was forgotten, and no one really uh, utilized it. So I just took it and I developed it and I bought it for almost nothing. And I just developed it with minimum amount of money and we just got this uh, gorgeous product. And this is really is valued at now more than 10 times what, uh, what I bought it for. I guess no one's going to argue about you driving on your own grass. <laughs> 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 nice weather today also. It's beautiful, yeah. uh -huh. Home Sweet Home has 317 rooms. Prince Al-Walid, now single after three divorces, lives in the center with his children in separate wings. The 460,000 square feet Riyadh Palace feels like a small city with 18 sitting rooms, 15 dining rooms, hairdressing salons and its own sports center. The whole place is interconnected by a series of corridors and elevators. Prince Al-Walid values having his son and daughter close to him, especially after nearly losing Prince Khalid in a terrible accident when he was just 15. I was on a jet ski and I did one of the stupid moves and everything I used to do, which worked pretty well before. I don't know why it didn't this time, but anyway, I ended up crushing my skull. 
and uh, paralyzing my right side. He, he broke his head. The bones were broken right. and they were like this. I mean, well, middle from the sagittal artery of the brain, God forbid he was bye-bye. First time I walked and I was on, having the cane and I saw my dad walk away. I'm like, why is my dad walking away? He went behind, just like a behind a corridor and just held his head down and stood, and he cried. And first time I see my dad cry. And I remember it like yesterday. Today, Prince Khalid is in full health and back on his jet ski. He's a little more cautious on the water. Well, most of the time. Every weekend, the prince puts aside his billionaire trappings to visit the place where he feels most at home. After seeing his luxury lifestyle and talking to his friends and family, I was curious to discover why this remote place is so special to him. Who is Al-Walid when he's alone? Out here at his desert camp, a couple of hours drive from Riyadh, the prince switches gear. What goes through his mind? Oh, I think of everything. I, have, I, I think of last week, last month, let's, last year, last decade, and I think of the future, where I'm right now, where I'm heading. See, not a single decision in my life, whether it's personal or professional. Nothing, no decision has been taken without me being in the desert. Your uh, city uh, bank deal was done, thought up in the desert, or confirmed oh, in the desert. It was, it, it was thought of in the desert, and it was finalized from the desert, and it was signed through, through by, by fax through from the desert. It's kind of ironic that a man who can have almost anything he wants comes to a place where there is nothing. You know, I just feel much, very much at home. You know, the, the serenity, the openness, the freedom, the liberty you have here, uh, to me is very important. You have a lot. How much do you give back? Yeah, you know, in Islam you have uh, one, uh, one uh, pillar of Islam is a zakat. Zakat is Islamic tax. And it is 2.5% two, two of, uh, of a certain formula that not, not necessarily related only to income, but to wealth, net worth. So I do, I apply that obviously, but I do a lot more than that. Who do you target with your uh, charity? Uh, the needy people, the ones who wants to get married, the one who has a loan, the ones who likes to go to the hospital. It's a wide array of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of people that we contribute to. The prince says he gives $100 million to charity every year and has a dozen staff to manage his contributions. But I also saw that he likes to personally meet with those to whom he donates. Look, this guy sleeps here. Do you believe this now? During the holy month of Ramadan, I was given the very rare chance to follow him through a poor area as he went from house to house giving envelopes containing cash. Each package is filled with the equivalent of 1,200 US dollars to directly target Saudis in the That amount matches about a year's rent for most of these people. It may seem random as he wanders through the ghetto, but in actual fact it's part of a highly efficient charity program that keeps track of who gets what. Though Saudi Arabia gets the bulk of his charity, in Beirut, where he spent much of his childhood, he has set up a foundation to handle the huge number of requests he gets for help from Lebanon. The organization is headed by his aunt, who says they don't just throw money at problems. So many people can take money and go. Uh, I prefer to exam uh, very carefully all the demands of the institutions. They are... Uh, asking and, uh, and after to give them uh, instead of money, supplies or materials in medical materials or uh, computers or uh, anything instead of money. A lot of wealthy people are accused of giving money as a way to appease their guilt for having so much themselves. No, no, from my point of view I have no guilt at all because the money I got it was earned the hard way, it was not inherited, it was not given to me. So I, I don't have guilt at all from that point of view. When the Bedouins come to meet you at your uh, desert camp, I've seen them recite uh, and, and they petition you. What, what exactly is the process? Explain that to me. The process is that they come here and uh, the, well, some of them will come and just say hello and uh, 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 give their good wishes. Some of them petition and give uh, their certain requests. And there's a committee in my palace uh, that goes over all these papers. And um, there's a certain criteria that, ha that have to be met. And each one is, is, is granted an amount uh, proportionate to the need that, that uh, uh, has been designated by our people. 
From weekly encounters with desert Bedouins to global trips meeting political leaders, the prince easily slips between Arab and Western worlds, rich and poor, and the powerful and weak. How could this cross-cultural skill serve him? There are hints that Al-Walid is nurturing political ambitions either in Lebanon or Saudi Arabia, where he's been calling for reform like his father once did. He believes in democracy. And I've read some of his statements, which are quite surprising. Uh, he has, in, in, in effect, called for direct elections or elections in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and as a top member of the royal family, I'm sure that he received some criticism from his uh, brothers and sisters and cousins because of that statement. But I think that demonstrates his, uh, his, his personal commitment to expanding the uh, beneficial aspects of a democracy. But the prince has already learned that politics is a difficult tightrope to walk between different emotions, beliefs, and personal or party agendas. So was Al-Walid's visit to Ground Zero in New York lost in politics, or did it become a powerful political move for him? America was not in a mood to listen, and people said he could have either waited or come up with some other kind of scheme, but the fact that the, the check was rejected um, uh, sort of didn't put him in good light. Although it was rejected because he linked it uh, to the U.S. policy overseas, especially in the Middle East. Yes. And that gained him some points because uh, he was frank and, and one of the things that people said at least while giving this he had the guts to say that you have to have an equal policy for the Middle East. People were looking for somebody very honest from this part of the world to speak his mind. And Prince Walid was a perfect candidate for that. We respected him a lot. And we think that he went there just to prove to the Americans that uh, being an Arab is not being a terrorist automatically, or being a Muslim is not also being a terrorist automatically. I think it started fine, and it ended uh, in a very bad way because it wasn't a question of uh, uh, what he was saying and whether that was right or wrong. It was the wrong platform to be delivering that message to that mayor in this city at that time. I would say just one word, politics. A very good relationship in the West and very good relationship in the East, not only in my, in my country but in my region. So I'm going to use that to really bridge uh, uh, the, the, the both societies as much as I can. So I'm not going to say I'm not going to get involved in politics, I'm not going to be involved in what's going on between West and East when I know I can do something. I can't just say I'm going to be a businessman and that's about it. No. I think the, the fact that I have this, uh, this stature uh, and, and this, 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 um, this position, I like to leverage it and use it. أنا أقول لا يبتعد بالعكس ولكن لا يكون حذرا ويكون أكثر أقل اندفاعا في الأمور السياسية عنها من الأمور الاقتصادية ولكنه لا لا يترك الميدان. It takes a long time to get a complete picture of the prince, and even then, the picture doesn't tell the full story. From early childhood, the prince has always persevered to get what he wants. So, what's his next step? Well, the story of Al-Walid, businessman, billionaire, prince, is certainly far from over.